All right, here we go. The first lady of death row, Joelle. Happy to have you on the platform. Well, how you doing, Art? It's, I'm happy to be here, and I'm just going to make a slight correction for you. I was the former first lady of death row. I'm not the lady of death row anymore because there is no death row. We have um, E1 and a couple of other people that took over the company. So they're saying that they're supposed to get with the artist and make everything right. So maybe I'll get a good check instead of that little pocket change that I have to put gas in my car every week. <laughs> so my catalog stems back from <clears throat> NWA album. Um, actually, whoo, I'm gonna just rewind the clock a little bit. I don't know if you heard of the Dream Team, LA Dream Team. Ladies and gentlemen, the Dream to Dream to Dream 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 Team is in the house. Oh yes, we're here. The Dream Team is here. That was me. So that's like old school. And then we had, of course, I was on the Niggas for Life album. And I rather F U U. Um, I'm a grandma now, so I don't want to be too graphic, but everybody, that was like a household song that they had. And of course I did, for the love of money, love of money. And they put like Shatasha Williams on the song. So I'm coming to get my money. It was not Shatasha. It was, you know who, Jewel. So I left the NWA and came over to Death Row. We did, the first soundtrack we did was Deep Cover soundtrack. So Snoop did 187 on the undercover call. You know, that's what got him on the map. But during the movie, I don't know if y'all ever heard Love, Love, Love or Lust was my song that they played actually in the Deep Cover movie. So I did that. And then of course, we had to go to the chronic baby so i did uh i'm gonna just have to say this because so number 16 on the album was bitches ain't shit so i did that i did dre day um swing down sweet jerry stop and let me ride so people don't know i could disguise my voice because you know i'm kind of a chameleon when it comes to that so we did let me ride let me see i did Gin and Juice with Snoop Dogg. We did Snoop Dogg and Dogg. Well, actually, when we, caught, when we recorded that record, I had went to jail for shooting this nigga named Putin who started the Blood Gang. And he started the Blood Gang, California. So I had a lot of niggas wanting to kill me after I shot dude, but they don't know it was self-defense because he was beating me up and he was very violent and jealous and he broke my wrist and uh, beat me up pretty bad. So I end up, he pulled a 10 millimeter HK on me. So I just prayed to the Lord because you know, I'm from the church and I was like, Lord, give me the strength of Samson. He said, it was right after I recorded Woman to Woman for the Murder Was a Case soundtrack. And he said, I'm gonna kill you, and I'm gonna kill your son, and then I'm gonna kill myself. And I was like, oh, my heart got the beating. You know, you feel like your skin is on fire. And I was like, oh Lord, oh Lord, what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do. So I locked myself in the bathroom. And, and then he came out and he was like, come out of that bathroom. So he bust the door open because I was like 160 pounds. He was like 230. He was very buff, you know, and uh, he got in that door and he had that 10 millimeter HK. And all I know is I just, I prayed to the Lord. I said, give me the strength of Samson. So I grabbed the gun and I wrestled him for the gun and his hand was actually the one that was on the trigger. So he ended up getting shot in the chest during the uh the struggle so the police i called i was like i just shot my boyfriend so the police they came there was no gun residue on my hands and everything and then he was telling them it was an accident it was an accident so he told me 
as he was laying on the ground, he was like, I got a lot of enemies. Don't send me to jail. Please don't send me to jail. Somebody going to kill me. You know, I let him know it was an accident. I'm sorry. I love you. I just love you so much. I just thought you was going to get rich and leave me. So the nigga heard woman to woman. He just thought I should be out of there. But you know, woman to woman was 72 with a billboard on Hot 100. But anyway, uh, so that was the emotion behind that. But we, we did the, after the Chronic album, then Snoop album came out. So in between that, we was dropping various soundtracks. Of course, Murder Was The Case. And everybody know I did, what would you do if you can get with the dog pound? What would you do? Would you get caught with your pants down? So we did, what would you do? And I had a, it's not deep enough on now. You know, so <laughs> murder, murder was the case that they gave me. So I did the backgrounds on that. You know, it's like every song, well, mostly every song. I can't, I can't take credit because To Live and Die in L.A. was a good song. Val Young was on that. But <clears throat> if you want to see what was under my belt, mostly every song I ever did, I wrote my own lyrics. It was a hit. I don't really mean to brag on myself, but such a girl pretty bad. How did you first meet Suge Knight, and how did you first get started with Death Row? Well, how I first met Suge was Easy e Dr. Dre, Yella, Ren, Ice Cube, you know, they was with N.W.A. They had a studio in Torrance where they was recording. Well, Suge was their bodyguard. So, um, I sort of met him when he was bodyguarding for them. And then we had a place called Marla's Memory Lane back in the day. So, Lachelle was like, Jewel. Now, we call her Lachelle. That's Suge's natural blood cousin. And um, she was like, I'm going to take you up there to meet Dr. Dre. So, I had actually met Suge before I met Dre. Um, now, this is before I end up going to the studio. So that's where I met Dre first at Marla's Memory Lane. And then he told me to come to the studio in Torrance. And that's where I met Easy e and Suge because he was the bodyguard. So I did all that music for them. Then they went on tour with Guns N' Roses. So we had a few shows, you know, like here and there. And then when they came back, they wanted to start their record label. And that's when I got a call and was like, meet me up here. They wanted to sign me. So me and DOC was actually the first artist ever signed, not to Death Row, but to Future Shock Records, which was Lydia, Michael Harris, and Suge's label. Then Suge wanted to start his own thing with Jimmy Iovine and Interscope. And that's how we came up with Death Row. Now, Bad Boy was popping. Uh, Russell Simmons' label was popping. So, you know, Def Jam was out. You know, all these other names. So they was trying to come up with a name and they was like Death Road and you know, all this other stuff. I'm just kind of like sitting there. And this is why we was recording the Chronic album. And I'm like, I said, Dre, all of us got cases pretty much. So we should call it Death Row. And we should put the man in the lecture chair. That should be the logo and the design. He was like, hell yeah, that's dope. So <coughs> the first logo was actually drawn by this lady named Nedra. She just did like a little blueprint just to get, you know, the logo with the man in the lecture chair. And then later on, they got Hen G to draw the official Death Row logo. You was on Death Row when it first started. 
How was it like being on Death Row before all the drama? We were like family. We were hungry. We was in that studio day and night. And we didn't come out until we had them hits. We was eating Popeye's chicken every day. Uh, <coughs> some of us were still struggling. And I think I was still getting food stamps at the time. So I would be cooking food and bringing it to the studio while I was just now getting started as an artist. You know what I'm saying? So it was like family. We were like family, you know? So in the beginning when everybody was together, I think that's what made it so important because the recipe, a little flavor from everybody, we were all equally as talented. You had Snoop. Dre, DLC, Warren G, Lady of Rage, Dog Pound, RBX. Who does that? You know what I'm saying? So it was like the next Motown, but with that gangsterism. You know what I mean? Right. So I was just really hurt with Suge that he turned the label. It became more like a game banging fest instead of about the music, it started becoming more about the streets. So what was the plan Suge Knight had for you? Because you was on Doggy Star, you was on Gin and Juice and Murder Was The Case. And you know, at that time, man, I mean, Doggy Star was like the biggest thing out. So what was the plan Suge Knight had for you? So <clears throat> originally my album was supposed to come out like shortly after the chronic, okay? But with Snoop and how 187 on an Undercover Cop just really hit, he said, hey, relative, we're going to put the Snoop out of my, but you're going to be all over it. So you're going to get some publishing. You're going to get some, you know, some shine and whatever, whatever. So you couldn't deny that talent. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I'm a team player. And uh, I was like, cool. But then when Snoop came in the studio, he ended up bringing Warren G. Warren G brought the dog pound. So my album is steady getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. But I still was able to be on all those records. So although visually I was a juicy girl, Back in them days, they wanted a Slim Jim. So I was never seen, but my voice was heard. So you never really saw me in any videos until, like I said, uh, I shot the pudding guy. I went to jail. I'm very OCD, so I didn't want to eat none of the food. So I was in there for three months. First and facing first it was attempted murder then a murder charge. So I lost the gang of weight, only drinking my milk and eating an apple for three months. So I was a skinny girl when I came out. So they put me in the what would you do video. And that's when I had the boobies kind of up, was looking kind of right, you know what I mean? So I did that, what would you do video? And the hits just kept coming. So in between those albums, we was doing soundtracks. But the bad thing about that is, now Suge was a very brilliant man, don't get me wrong. He was a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but he was a brilliant man. But systematically, instead of him having like a rap division, a R&B division, a country division, and releasing some of these albums, we had to do like one after the other. Just like M&M's, you can suck them down and eat the peanut, but you just gotta have one after the other. So it kind of slowed everything down. So I wasn't never upset with the process, but I was mad that my album really never came out. And then I went on national TV, and this is back in the day when BET really didn't have a an audience, and you just kind of performed for Shirley, and what was the guy with the green eyes? What was his name? 
Donna Simpson. Um, <clears throat> so I went on there and I performed Woman to Woman and one of the songs from my Black Diamond album and told all the people, my album coming out, this was 1995. It's called Black Diamond. And I did like an epic performance. And shortly after that, I just got on the shelf. So Shug, let me just let y'all know this little secret, okay? Me and Shug was more than just friends. He was like my brother. Ah, y'all thought I gave him some. Nope. And he never got the Jewel experience. Nope. Um, we was more like brothers and sisters. So I think that's kind of where my album kept getting pushed back because he was like, you know, you know how you do family sometime. Like she would be I, right. you know what I'm saying? So he just treated me like family, but he never gave me the credit that I really deserved as an artist. Let's say, okay, so I did this one picture with me over some railroad tracks and I was in a sexy, like, two-piece, like, a long thing with the shorts. And this was right after Woman to Woman had kind of, like, blew up. Well, they put me in a Rolling Stone magazine. And they was like, oh, this artist right here, this lady is a force to be reckoned with. And she was going to say, you ain't doing no more magazines, relative. I don't want you all in the public like that. And I'm like, huh? But they gave me, like, so much credit. But he didn't... He wanted me to just sit down and just wait. So I think as my brother, I loved him. But as a man that was kind of like in charge of my career, he didn't appreciate or respect my contribution to those $550 million worth of records that I helped him sell. 